A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord said to Abraham, how great is the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, and how very grave their sin. I must go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. So the men turned from there, and they went toward Sodom, while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not forgive it if the righteous for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will forgive the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered, let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord. I, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Again, he spoke to him, suppose you find 40 are there. He answered, for the sake of the 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak just once more. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. The word of the Lord. We'll say our psalm together. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name because of your love and faithfulness. When I called, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. Though the Lord be high, he cares for the lowly. He perceives the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. The Lord will make good his purpose for me. O oh Lord, your love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. From the letter of Paul to the Colossians. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him and established in faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, 
God made you alive together with him when he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. Therefore, do not let anyone condemn you in matters of food or drink or observing festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths. These are only a shadow of what is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Do not let anyone disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, dwelling on visions, puffed up without cause by a human way of thinking, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows with a growth that is from God, the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, Lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, saying, Do you do not bother me? The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, Jesus said, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his shameless persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are stressed out and can't see clearly, know how to give good, give good gifts to your children... How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Grace to you and peace. Good morning. I was able to sit down this, this week with a couple of parents, and one of the things that um, each of them st stressed or mentioned in our conversation was that all this violence in the world is beginning to affect their children. 
not unusual of a thing, especially as much as we've heard about lately, and add to that not only the violence um, in this country and abroad, everywhere it seems, there's also all this hatred and conjecture and divisiveness that seems to be defining a cert- our culture right now, sp- especially um, those of us who claim allegiances to one side or the other, and our children are starting to suffer a little bit, we believe, at least the parents do, uh, from from hearing all this, seeing all this. I came across across a wonderful little quotation online. Um, A woman says, people are still good, mostly. And a man replies, that's not what I'm hearing. And she says, love is quieter than gunshots but there's more of it. That comes from a, a, a website called A Small Fiction, and there's lots of little pieces like that, little short stories, no longer than what I just mentioned to you. Love is quieter than gunshots, but there's more of it. We're witnessing today in the Old Testament lesson, um, in the Old Testament lesson, what seems to be the beginning of the transformation of God. God is about to do everything he can to smite the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham, who is not really a prophet, but acts as a prophet in this instance, comes to God and says, you know, I'm, I, I, I mean to be a humble man before you, God, but I got to tell you, um, destroying a whole city is not the way to go about winning friends and, and making friends in, in the world. And I think you're better than that. And I think your commitment to love defies violence. And you have no right to do this, say in, in his humble way, of course. Perhaps there were 50 people who were good. Would you destroy the whole city? And you see the trajectory of where this goes. What if they're 40? What if they're 35? What if they're 10? What if there's one? What if there's none? What if nobody is worth saving? What is the proper response to such evil and hatred and violence and guilt? The trajectory of what's happening here in the Old Testament story is that it seems as though God is beginning to lean towards the innocent, leaning on the innocent as if to say it would not be just to destroy any innocent people all the way through that to it might not be just to destroy even the evil folks, the unrighteous, the guilty. So you may know the rest of this story, and you may know that God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah except for Gomorrah and except for Lot and a few people anyway, which leaves evidently Abraham wondering what the world God is doing, and I wonder too what's happening in this narrative of destruction that might be something of learning for us. And it seems as though, even though I don't like God's actions in the story and we don't like that kind of violence, it seems as though God is making a point that innocent actually do suffer, always. And the question is, does it have to be that way? Do we have to continue it? Is it our job to perpetuate such suffering, such violence? Paul, in in his response to the early churches, and I know that you've heard me say that we don't think Colossians was written by Paul, and that's really kind of irrelevant. It's in the Bible, and it sounds good. And if Paul wrote it, great. And if he doesn't, who cares? It's still good stuff. Paul is trying even if Paul didn't write this, in his other letters, just like in Colossians, Paul is trying to get the little, the little small churches in the, in the first century, those little followers of Christ, he's trying to get them to realize who they are. And they're starting to bicker and fight. And in their bickering and fighting, they're starting to lose sight of what they were created, who they were created to be. And Paul Whoever reminds them that there is a certain connection to God that each of us has, and that connection, that mystical, mystical embodiment of God is a part of all of us, and it says that that is the substance of who we are. The substance 
of who we are is love. And when we lose sight of that and start to think that maybe retaliation and a certain violent approach to life or certain hatred of speech, when we start to fall into that, we have lost, Paul says, we have lost the deepest connection to the substance of who we are. We have fallen into a habit which is not helping this world. And so the question becomes then, what habits should we fall into? What habits should we commit to? In the gospel this morning, Jesus is, is asked to, to teach his disciples to, to pray. And, and, and you know this, it's the, it's the um, Lord's Prayer, at least, at least a synopsis of it when you pray make sure you know who you're praying to make sure you are connected to the will of God make sure you ask for the things that will sustain you today and God help us that we don't have to suffer towards the end that's the prayer it, it seems and then he goes into the portion that everybody knows really well ask search knock ask search knock ask search knock there's a certain certain leading us into a persistence in prayer whether we know what we're doing or don't know what we're doing and you might have heard me reading this morning you might have noticed that I didn't read it exactly as it's written those of you who were following along there's um, in, when this guy goes to this friend's door and knocks on it um, even though he's his friend, uh, he will give him what he asks for his shameless persistence. The, wor the word there means shameless persistence. Persistence is just a piece of the meaning. And so there's a certain connotation there that we should be shameless in our persistent prayers. <laughs> even if we don't know what we're doing, even if we're asking for the wrong thing, even if it's selfish, even if we don't have any idea what we need or the world needs or how to respond in love anyway, we need to find a way to be in shameless, persistent prayer. And then the story goes on um, in the gospel. Jesus continues to try to lead us into a constructive habit of love. And, and in doing so, he, he defines us a little bit. And, and it's not in a good way, actually. And this is the other place in the gospel where, where I sort of change the words. Um, if you then who are evil, the word there is a uh, Greek word, poneros. And, um, and, poneros. and uh, it, it, we often translate that word as evil. But what it means is to be pressed upon. It means to be like under the thumb of a great weight. If you then, it means to be stressed out. It reminds me of the song, Under Pressure. Y'all know that song, right? <laughs> Under so anyway, the, the word, so I changed it to, for you, you then who are stressed out and can't see clearly, which is what that means. It means to be pressed upon so much so that we don't see the reality as it is to be pressed upon that way, to be under pressure. The kind of pressure, if you know that song, um, that puts people in the streets and splits families in two. To be under that pressure and to fall into the notion that the reality of life is violence and violence alone. If those of us who are under that kind of pressure can do good things for our children? Isn't it fair to say that the God who loves us and only means love for us can be there when we ask and when we search and when we knock? It's quieter than gunshot, but there's a whole lot of it. This song that I, that I mentioned, Under, Under Pressure, is probably one of the greatest 
I mean, everybody who knows me more than six seconds knows that really when I grow up, I want to be a rock and roll star. I'm going to be a rock singer one day, and I'm turning 50 this year, and I swear I'm going to do it before I die. <laughs> um, any, in, anyway, um, that, that song, Under Pressure, is probably one of the greatest rock and roll songs ever written. And, and, and I say that not just because it's got the best bass line ever. Dun, 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 dun. Dude, everybody knows this song. I mean, even you old folks know this song, right? I mean, it's written in 1982 by David Bowie uh, and, and, and the lead singer of Queen. Say his name for me. Oh, come on, people. <laughs> Freddie Mercury. Um, it was written by, by the two of them. Um, such a fabulous song. I, I invite you, you. You can do what you want, and you can say, I don't like rock and roll. I don't care. But I invite you to go to your computer and pull up the song and then read the lyrics. To that song. Prayer, tomorrow, I pray that tomorrow will take me higher. We need, we need to change the way. Love dares us, the song says, to care for the people who are on the edge of darkness. Love dares us to change the way we feel about ourselves. And this is the last dance. This is maybe the last chance we get. We are under pressure. Is there any way that you know of to release that valve. Is there some way better than sitting in stillness, at least for a moment, and letting it go? Is there a better way for us to not participate in the bull business <laughs> that is happening in our world and to be what Paul, our patron saint, calls us to be, which is a model to those who are dying from the pressure. Ask. Search. Just knock over and over and over. There is a better way to do life than we're doing it. And we have to be committed to that, all of us, under pressure or not. Love is quieter than gunshots, but there is a hell of a lot more of it. It's worth asking for. Amen. you please stand? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified, and spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Let us lift our petitions to God, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For the ministers of the church, that they build a community of love, which flows from the community of God, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. <clears throat> For every member of the human family, that be, we be guided to all truth by the spirit of truth, we pray to the Lord. Hear and hear our prayer. <clears throat> For the stewards of the earth, that they accept creation as a wondrous gift and work to preserve its beauty, we pray to the Lord. Lord For the sick, that their afflictions lead to endurance, that their endurance leads to hope, we pray to the Lord. For all who have died in the hope of resurrection, we pray to the Lord. For us who celebrate community here, that our labors bring joy and our witness bring peace, we pray to the Lord. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, please add your prayers either silently or aloud. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you.